Thank you, Lauren. Uh, it's really nice to be here. I've seen old friends from when I was a graduate student, and I have new people that uh, I've never met before, and a lot of people in between. So. Uh, it's, uh, people have been extraordinarily hospitable, so I'm really happy to be here. And I'm happy to talk about these things. Um, aging is something we're all engaged in, and if we're not doing, think we're doing it right now, we are. <laughs> and it's something that we're gonna be doing for the rest of our lives. So, um, I'm gonna talk about I got, uh, it works, Lance. Uh, I'm going to talk about the things that I've been doing in biodemography, but I decided I would make it really easy for people. I'm just going to tell you all the major points I'm going to make, and then you can relax, and you can nod off whatever you want, and you can come in and out, and you'll still know what we were talking about. So um, first I'm going to talk about social, economic, and psychological factors, and how important they are in influencing the whole process of aging. And of course, uh, those things work through behavioral factors as well as healthcare, accessibility and use, and a number of other factors which I'm really not gonna talk about today, but I do understand that there are all these links that go on through life. And one of the things that we have come to study in great detail is how social factors actually work through biology, and I'm going to talk about that, a lot of that today, and um, talk about changes that might occur either in social factors or in biology that would help one delay aging uh, and improve the length of healthy life, because that's really what we're after. And I think in the near future, it will be possible to make lots of interventions that are not possible today. So that's kind of where I'm going to end up. So people like me who study aging, when we talk about aging, what we're really talking about is health. That's where I have spent my career looking at health outcomes. And in the last couple decades, how they change with age, and how they increase with age. And I've sort of laid out this schema here as to the process of health changes with age. It starts early, and I'll talk a little bit about that, with biological changes and diseases and conditions become onset. Then people at least for populations, there's an onset of disability, and finally there's death. So it's a process. And you can intervene in this process between any of these portions. Now what we've done mostly to date is we've spent a lot of time after people get diseases, and we've intervened then, and we've tried to save their lives and prevent the progression of the disease. That's been sort of our major way of dealing with trying to make healthier aging. And it hasn't really worked on the population level. For individuals, it may work. On the population level, it really doesn't work that very well that way. Because if you intervene there, as we have done, this is... Uh, a bunch of um, bars that show the years of life lived and how many of them are years with diseases. And the dark orange is the diseases and time change is shown over 20 years. And so the bad thing is a year of life with disease. And what you'll notice is if you look at each pair of bars, it's the second one that's longer. And that's the number of years with disease. And that's the more recent bar there from 2018. So what has happened is we indeed have saved people from dying. We have saved them to live longer with disease. That may be a plus, but for a population, it is not making us healthier. We are actually living more years with disease. And what you see there is it's pretty substantial. So the years with hypertension go from about seven to about 12 in that slide. And all of them except stroke are 
expanded in the more recent years. So this is kind of where we start. Like we've been trying for a long time to do what we call compress morbidity and, and get more healthy years. And it's hard. We haven't made a lot of progress there in, in the population level. So we got to attack aging or approach aging, healthy aging, in a different way. So now I'm going to think about what is aging? When does it start? When does aging begin? Before I started teaching with a biologist, which I've done now for about 15 years, 20 years maybe, I've learned a lot of biology that way because we sort of have a class where it's half social and half biology and we argue with each other. It's kind of fun. But I used to say aging began at birth. Now I know that age, aging begins in your grandmother's ovaries and it continues after that because your grandmother has your mother who already has the eggs that become you. So it's, it starts very, very early in life and you can get exposed to things that are gonna affect your aging from that period on, which is pretty early. So early, uh, probably about 40 years ago, uh, David Barker started talking about the developmental origins of disease, which has been a real sort of guide for people who are looking at what can, how early life and late life relate uh, in terms of health. And David Barker showed that um, people who had restricted fetal development and growth were more likely when they became old to actually have cardiovascular conditions. And that was an important way of redirecting research. People who studied um, the uh, offspring from the Dutch hunger winter that took place at the end of the Second World War found that mothers who had nutritional problems during their pregnancy actually ended up with children who ended up in their adulthood with more schizophrenia. So we've seen sort of ways in which early life affects life many, many decades later. And in some work that uh, Chuck Finch and I did and with uh, Doug Allman from Columbia, we looked at the, many years ago, before anybody cared about flu, we looked at the effect of being a, uh, in fetal development at the time of the 1918 flu epidemic and we said, what happened to those people who were just in utero? We don't know what happened to their mothers, but we know they were in utero at the worst time of the flu epidemic. And we, follow, we looked at those people 75 years later, and we found there was more heart disease among people in utero. And what the figure is showing there is that before it was low, after it was low, but the in utero people were there. So basically indicating people already had conditions that led to more heart disease 70 years down the line from something they had no idea they had probably been exposed to. So that's basically when aging begins, which means aging is with you throughout your life cycle, that anything you're exposed to can have an effect. It doesn't mean it's the biggest effect, but it can have some effect. So also in working with biologists, I'm in a very multidisciplinary school. I'm in a school of gerontology. It's sort of half social science types and half biologists. So we talk a lot with each other and I have been trying to encourage them to think about starting from human models, rather than they start sometimes with yeast or mice or worms, start with humans and see what's going on with humans and then develop your 
RCTs so that um, we actually are testing some of the, the mechanisms that we see are actually occurring in humans. So I've started this um, talking what I, about what I call the fundamental causes of earlier aging and the social hallmarks of aging. It's a total ripoff of the biologists, because I'll say later, they made a list of the hallmarks of aging, which are biological. And I said, well, you know, there's some, uh, there's some use to that kind of approach, because you can sort of, in a very quick way, show people that these are the very important things that determine aging. So I called um, low socioeconomic status, minority status, adverse behaviors, adverse psychological states, and adverse life events, the fundamental causes of earlier aging. And that those should sort of guide some of the research that goes on to determine how to deal with health problems that occur uh, with aging. And just to make the case that those really are important things, I'll just go through a quick series of slides showing how important they are in terms of life expectancy and health outcomes. <coughs> Sorry. So first of all, uh, life expectancy at birth varies by 18 years from the, the lowest uh, life expectancy among an ethnic group, uh, Native Americans in the US, to the highest, Asian Americans. It's quite a substantial difference in life expectancy at birth. Life expectancy at age 18 uh, very, ranges over 16 years from people with less than high school to people that have an advanced degree or higher. Again, quite a substantial difference. Life expectancy at age 40 is nine years lower for those in the 10th percentile of income compared to those in the 90th percentile of income. Now, all of these things are totally related. I understand that, but they're just different metrics for saying how important these things are. Life expectancy at age 25 is 10 years lower for those with experience of severe mental health problems before the age of 25. Again, quite substantial. And life expectancy is about 10 years higher for those with five good health behaviors compared to those with no good health behaviors. And health behaviors are eating, drinking, weight, physical activity, the normal things is smoking, just things that you think of as uh, important health behaviors. And this is a finally preventing adverse childhood experiences can potentially reduce uh, negative health across a variety of conditions and outcomes in adulthood. Those are significant declines that would occur if ACEs were eliminated. So all of these things are extremely important in determining the health at older ages. So as I said before, I understand that the social hallmarks of aging are connected to adverse health outcomes through lots of social, economic, psychological, healthcare paths. Um, over time, uh, I have become more convinced of the important, uh, importance of psychological factors, stress, depression, uh, psychological pressures, I think I was, a, I'm a diet in the wool demographer. I think I was a little bit suspicious initially of some psychological work. I've become more and more convinced as I think a number of other people have been about um, the toll that adverse psychological conditions can actually take <laughs> on, on people. And so I think there are a number of ways that are very important, which all the social hallmarks then interact with psychological conditions. And as certainly there are then things outside people, discrimination, 
There's people's ability to purchase things that can improve their health or make their life easier. It varies, and certainly we all know about health care and how important that is and how inequitably distributed it is, up, at least up until older age. And then more recently, we've all been looking at environmental exposures and finding that some people are more exposed to poor environments than other people are. So all of these things are just part of the pathways that actually make those social hallmarks result in less healthy life and shorter life with aging. Now, I'm going to talk about how you might uh, look at biology and try to change some of this, but I don't want to sort of pretend that the most, the, the best way and to do things might be to just change the um, adverse circumstances that are associated with all these social hallmarks and that that is possible and a way to proceed, but it may not be the only way, but it is, it would be an important way and it's the way we should all um, encourage health policy to actually proceed. So I don't want to ignore that and pretend I'm just all for pills uh, and not for change in behavior, but I've waited a long time for behavior to change and we haven't gotten very far. So anyway, um, and there are many people for whom damage is already done and you want to be able to have some intervention to see if you can actually improve uh, health for those people for whom uh, life has proceeded and, and changes have occurred in their health system. So is it possible to delay and prevent disease or change the rate of aging? That's sort of the question that we've started with. Um, and basically saying social factors have to get under the skin through biology, that it's just not the social aspect that is, is the final answer. The, the, it's the fundamental issue, but it has to work through biology to actually end up causing mortality or, or morbidity. So the question is, can we do something about understanding this biology that goes from social exposure, mediates uh, our lives before we get to these adverse um, health outcomes. And what we have proposed is that chronological age may not be the best indicator of aging per se when it comes to being interested in health outcomes, but that biological age is an idea that needs to be incorporated and that people of the same chronological age can have quite different biological ages. So people can be born at the same time and they can progress through life and some people may earlier have some of the changes that occur with age and die earlier than others because they have a, a higher biological age relative to their chronological age. And so we have been looking at and developing measures of the difference between biological and chronological age. So we can divide people into people who are accelerated agers, people who are aging faster, and people who are aging slower than might be expected compared to people who are aging as chronologically one might expect or average chronological age. <coughs> so um, we need to be able to determine when uh, bi the biology underlying aging is changing. Now, I'd say we've been on 30-year um, task of trying to decide how to measure biological age. There's no one way. There's a lot of um, people have 
uh, proposed approaches, and I would say going back to the Framingham risk score, which is a mixture of biology and behavior. But um, since then, there have been any number of um, indexes proposed. And in all honesty, they're not that different <laughs> in what they come out with. So I think the idea is right, and the content can vary. So um, I'm going to talk about, you know, I've been in this business a while. I've used a variety of measures, variety of data sets. I'm going to just talk fairly loosely about some of the measures and how they relate and, and where they come from. So I have proposed more recently a measure of expanded biological age because I wanted to put into this measure all the things that uh, Gero science was saying was most important, along with the things that we had already determined were most important. And so now I have a measure of what I call expanded biological age, which involves 22 markers, which are um, fairly normal clinical, chemical, physiological markers that many people would get from routine uh, exams, but some of them are a sort of more research oriented and, and you wouldn't get them, frankly. And these are things that we have gotten, collected in the health and retirement study. And I've told people today, it only takes you around 20 years to kind of propose something and actually have data to use um, it uh, because you got to convince people in Washington that it's the right thing to do. You got to get the money, you got to do the collection, you got to do that. Um, you got to do the assays, you got to, you got to do the uh, quality control assessment. And then what do you know? You have data. Only maybe 15 years, 20 years. It takes a long time, believe me. But once you get it rolling, it's pretty easy to add things. <laughs> and that's kind of where we are now. So I work on the health and retirement study, as Lauren said. And we collect blood from 10,000 people, and we get these kinds of markers. And we now have made this measure. And they're a nice, not only big sample, but representative sample and large numbers of people um, from racial and ethnic minorities. So it's really uh, a useful study. And now we have some number of sister studies in other parts of the world. Lauren is going off to make a sister study in Malawi. We have studies in uh, 39 countries. There are studies, we, it's not me, in 39 countries. And, and we do a lot of comparative work, um, which is very helpful to everyone, I will say, and replication. And we try to replicate things often so we find we're not just a one-off. You know, the one in 20 times it's significant. We try to reproduce it other places before we um, put things out. So basically, I have made this measure, which is, I'm not going to go, this is not a place for statistical things, but you figure out the average and how each person differs from the average, and you relate it, in this case, to mortality, and you put it together in an equation which weights each of the factors according to how related it is to mortality. And you can read the formula if you want. It works. And what we do is we basically set the measure so the average for the population equals the average age in the population. And then we get people who are accelerated or people who are delayed agers and divide them that way. And I think it's a very useful measure. And I'm going to show you. First, again, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to say. And then I'm going to show you, because I think it's just easier to know how it all goes together, that um, there are social differences in this biological aging, that uh, there are links between biological aging and the health outcomes we care about, that the explanatory power of social and biological variables can be shown, and we can see whether the biological age actually explains some of the social differences, by which I mean if we relate social factors to a health outcome and then we introduce biology in the middle, do we take away part 
of the association that was in the social variable with the outcome. And it, the explain is in the statistical sense, not in a, some basic sense, but in the statistical sense, do we account for the differences? Um, some one nice feature of this biological age, while I have not shown that, is that it changes at relatively young ages. So it may be identifiable relatively early in life, which is the aim of much of this kind of work. And it has changed over time, and it is appears to be changeable with intervention. So all of those things are reasons why this is an interesting measure, and it's sort of catching on, and I'll tell you why after I show you some of the data. So the difference between expanded biological age and chronological age is related to social factors, I said. Here's um, a figure that shows that people with low education, that's the leftmost bar here, have an accelerated biological age of about three years, while people with the highest education, like the people in this room, have on average uh, a two-year slower aging than the normal average person. African Americans have a biological age that's about three years higher than uh, non-Hispanic whites. So I can do a lot of social differences like that, and they come up pretty much the way you would expect. Um, so that it seems like it's an important variable in terms of related capturing how social differences get under the skin in a way that sort of puts it all in one measure and doesn't require your having 22 measures. So the next thing I said was that um, social factors explain a substantial part of the biological age. And this is, this is a slightly different measure, and we did it in NHANES, so it's all ages. But uh, we put every variable into the, oh no, I'm sorry, this is an, uh, still HRS. We put every variable into this we could think of that indicated adult adversity, which means, you know, um, all kinds of trauma, family problems, uh, problems at work, problems with the police, seeing, uh, having people uh, die or be very sick, basically a whole long list. We put as many childhood adversity things in as we could include, which included um, family problems, loss of parents, uh, economic, pro uh, no, economic problems are in the other one, school problems, a number of uh, having problems with the police, a number of problems in childhood. And then we had childhood SES and adult SES, which were, had a lot of pieces of them. And the question was how much of the variance in biological age in a population sample is explained by these indicators of what, what I call the social hallmarks of aging. And what you see is the big one is behaviors, which of course is sm smoking, drinking, uh, oh, weight and um, exercise, sleeping. It's a whole variety of health behaviors. And skip the polygenic scores and go, then next it's adult adversity. So we find that more recent adversity rather than childhood is more important, maybe not totally um, unexpected, but there's a role for childhood adversity, childhood SES, and adult SES. All of them, they come up and they explain about 25% of um, uh, the variability in the population in a biological age measure. 
So the one thing that I did stick in there was poly polygenic scores, which are DNA-derived uh, scores, which are basically every reasonable genetic factor we thought could be in such a model. And, and that explains about 4% of the variability. So basically, we're trying to be inclusive here. And it says biological age is pretty strongly related to most of these social factors, and they explain a reasonable amount of the variability. So then I also indicated biological age was seemed to be pretty useful in accounting for some social differences. So um, after we first developed this measure, we looked at the effect uh, of controlling for biological age on, different, on observed differences in mortality between blacks and whites. So that's two bars here. And this bar says, um, basically, with no controls for biological age, what we get is that black mortality, with age and sex controlled, of course, is about 48% higher than white mortality. When we control for biological age, the difference goes to zero. So that starts to say, well, maybe if we could make people alike on the biological age, we could make them more alike in their mortality outcome. So that's like one of the first times we actually showed that maybe it is useful. Now, there are a lot of people working in this area, and I think some of the more, most interesting work has been done by Dan Belsky and Terry Moffat, who work in a town in New Zealand on a cohort of a thousand who, people who once started as children and are now middle-aged, and, and they had uh, stored samples to be able to do longitudinal work over their sort of early adulthood to getting up to mid-age adulthood. This, this goes from their 20s to their 30s. They now are in their, they now have people in the middle 40s and they've done that. But what they showed was that you take a measure like this biological age and each line here is one of the markers and their markers are very similar to ours. But what they have done is look at longitudinal change and they have developed a marker called the pace of aging because it's longitudinal. But what they show is how early some of these changes are starting. And that's kind of what you're aiming for, is to be able to start controlling things or intervening to make sure people are on track in their 20s. You don't want to pick people up in their 60s and try to have to go backwards. Your best bet would be to actually try to control it earlier, and to, that would be the best way to delay the onset of conditions that come associated with these things. So that's another plus for this sort of biological age, that it's observable before mortality, before disease onset. It's something that can happen earlier in life. Some other good news that we have shown is that in recent years, some of the biological age actually got younger in the population. And, um, you know, it's specific to a time period here in that it's uh, the 90s, late 90s to the 2010, but people actually got better in terms of this measure if you, you know, fit the measure over a, a longer period of time. And why is that? We have been on an intervention that has gone on for basically 60 years, and we have controlled cholesterol. These are lines that are age-specific numbers uh, per, uh, uh, of cholesterol levels for people of middle-aged to old age, and what you see for this period from 1961 up to basically the present is a continual drop in the level of cholesterol. Which now, uh, I say I got in this business when it was hypertension and cholesterol. 
Well, there's not much high cholesterol around anymore, frankly. Um, if you take the indicators in the older population, there really isn't that much. And it's not because people behave well, it's because they take drugs. So the number of people who have ever been diagnosed with high cholesterol stays the same or goes up, but the number of people taking drugs goes up, goes up and the level goes down. And here's the same thing for hypertension. It's the same thing that it's a 60 year downward process and it looks like the population's getting healthier. Yes, they have lower levels of uh, blood pressure. And why do they have lower levels of blood pressure? Not because they've exercised, not because they've done something good, but they've taken pills and the pills have gotten better. So the interventions have gotten better, they control it. So we have many fewer people now who are actually hypertensive and that's because they are on drugs. So that's how, that, that's our first interventions, I think, to sort of improve aging. It shows it, it can work on a population level. Um, takes a long time, but it actually does work. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, the same uh, Dan Belsky has actually taken data from a randomized control trial of restricted eating to show that you can change biological age in 24 months with changes in the behavior. Now, calorie is a trial that's very well known in aging because it's one of the only RCTs that try to actually intervene by changing diet. It's really a hard diet. You have to be pretty hardcore to stay on the restricted diet that they wanted you to stay on. So it's not your random population, it's people who would spend two years not having many calories at all. When you do that, he then reanalyzed the data years after. It wasn't, they didn't even have biological age then, but they had these measures and he put them together and he said, well, these people who are the people who actually get the treatment have no aging. That's a, a flat line over two years. They have no aging, whereas the people who are not on the restricted diet actually continue to age. This is an, a, a, the people who want to do now uh, trials trying to measure aging are very interested in this kind of measure because it offers them an endpoint. And they didn't have an endpoint before, which is an interesting uh, idea. So people have been trying to get um, trials of various interventions, usually drugs, to prevent aging. But about 10 or more years, and probably 10 years ago now, when they went for permission to the FDA, they said, no, aging isn't a disease. You can't have trials where aging is the outcome. And in fact, you guys don't know what the outcome is. So no, you can't have trials on drugs to prevent aging because it's not a disease. So um, there is a group of people of various, you know, some of your friends probably even who study mortality and morbidity went and made a case for the FDA. Okay, can we, you know, we think this really should be looked at as a, an adverse health condition that would resp potentially respond to a trial. So we need to be allowed to, to do trials. Eventually they've talked them into it. Hardly, they've hardly started, but 
It took a while, it took years to talk them into it, basically. But one of the things they needed was an outcome measure. And so uh, then Biological Age started to offer them an outcome measure. So it sort of became one of the new ways of thinking about how to delay aging. Uh, many of the components uh, are, in a sense, treatable. So the first real trial that has not un really started yet is a trial for metformin, which is a drug for diabetes that's been around for 20, 30 years, that is used by millions, doesn't have many side effects, people think maybe it will delay aging, and they've gotten permission, sort of, to do this trial. They just don't have the millions of dollars it will take to watch people for six years and seven years in such a trial. But it, it will take place relatively shortly. And that's a drug that they're basically talking about repurposing. It's something that's out there. Why don't drug companies care? Because it's so cheap then nobody's going to make any money on it, except uh, that, you know, maybe Medicare won't have to pay for something for these people. For, but it's very hard to get drug companies interested in uh, using drugs that don't cost money. Uh, well, and by those don't cost money, I mean are relatively cheap <coughs> compared to the new ones that are still um, and, uh, not able to be sold in generic forms. It's also true that a lot of the markers that I had in the middle there of that 22 markers are indicators of inflammation, inflammatory markers that um, are uh, basically indicators of what some people think is a fundamental systematic encourager of aging, that having inflammation General inflammation is bad. We started out, we, we, we were born with a good inflammatory mechanism because we had to fight infectious diseases. People are probably real happy they had one during COVID, um, although a lot of people got this first, they, the, their first thing was to get the disease in there. You need the antibodies to fight it. And then the inflammation comes on and a lot of people got a uh, hard hit from really skyrocketing inflammation in this sort of fourth day, fifth day. And that's one of the reasons old people had trouble. Um, and the death rates were so much higher among older people. But we have an inflammatory system for a reason. <laughs> it's something that protects us, but if it's overactive, it can harm us. And it may be that, you know, in the world we evolved in, a really active inflammatory system to fight um, infection was what we needed. And the system we have now may be overactive for uh, the exposures that it's getting. But it, and we don't really treat it in inflammation. They're, they used to advise aspirin for a lot of people, and then they've taken that off unless you're in a certain risk group. Um, but just recently, they've come out with meds in the last few months that are for heart disease with high levels of inflammation which may be, again, another way to treat this. So there are things um, that are becoming treatable, um, that may be implemented, that have to do with this biological age. So, okay, we're sort of moving on. We're making a little bit of progress. And now, um, um, I, I think I already said that. Treatable now, yeah. We're moving on to the next level. So all of a sudden, the biologist, the geroscience comes on as a field, and the geroscience people say, ha, huh, there are a whole bunch of underlying molecular and cellular changes that really underlie all of aging. So all the outcomes of aging are in, and so that means cognitive, physical, disease, they're all influenced by these molecular and cellular changes. And this is really a different level. This is not what you measure at your doctor's office. So they introduce what are called the biological hallmarks of aging, which um, 
there are different specifications of this, but most people use this one that says there are nine hallmarks of aging. And they range from these epigenetic alterations. Telomere attrition really sort of caught on in the social sciences 10, 15 years ago, since gone out, but it, biomarkers go up and then down. It'll probably come back. Uh, mitochondrial dysfunction is in now. Those of us who are in the business of collecting data are trying to go down the list as fast as they say, not because we think it's necessarily the answer, but if they say that, then we got to try to test it. So we've gotten through the red ones <laughs> in HRS and, men, and some of our sister studies too. Um, we're hoping to move through the others in the next maybe six years, but some of them are still only in, in uh, other model systems, animals. They haven't even moved to human uh, testing at all, and they certainly haven't moved to being related to the kinds of factors that people who study populations want them to be related to. So it may still be a pipe dream, some of this, that, that has been proposed. But the thing that has probably caught on the most, and is probably the only one I'll, I'm going to talk about today, is the epigenetic changes um, that occur with aging. This is now measured in loads of studies. And it's only uh, 10 years kind of from discovery till now, and it has swept the world. It is really a very powerful tool. Not that anyone really knows what it means yet, but it's a very powerful, <laughs> it's related really strongly to things. So, you know, you have your DNA and that doesn't change. You got it, you're stuck with it. it it's whatever it is. But um, methyl groups can be attached to your genes. And when the, those methyl groups then uh, can change the action, genetic action, uh, they can turn things on and off, and they, they become important ways that your genes actually operate. And methyl groups can move, can change, can be added because of adverse life events, uh, exposures to bad things, stress, all the bad things that happen. And... Um, we now have these methods of, just like biological age, deciding whether people are epigenetically aging faster or slower than their chronological age. So um, epigenetic clocks, as I said, are only about 10 years old. The first ones were developed by Steve Horvath, who's a biologist who was at UCLA, he's now gone to Altos Labs. This is really an ingenious piece of science where he took um, samples from many species and many age groups and many substances and basically said, and what he did was he developed this approach to measuring epigenetics that said, which things are related to age? Now you start with a chip that has more than 800,000 markers on it. So you start with a lot of data and which ones delineate age? So he got very good at predicting age with epigenetics. And those of us in the world of people said, you know, we don't have a hard time figuring out how old people are. We sort of ask them when the day they were born and what day it is, we figure it out. So that's not so useful for us. But then the next generation of epigenetic clocks, which are just like the biological age, the average age in your epigenetic clock is your average age in your sample. They were trained on, first phenol age was trained on mortality. And that was done by Morgan Levine, who used to be a student of mine, a pre-doc. And uh, not when she was a pre-doc, <laughs> she didn't do it. <laughs> but so she made pheno age, which is trained on mortality, meaning I pick out the epigenetic markers that predict mortality. 
And then Steve Horvath and his group came back and made GrimAge, which is trained on a number of um, proteins and also pack years of smoking and also has agent sex in it. It's a complicated one. And that's called the second generation of clocks. The third generation of clocks, again, is Dan Belsky and Terry Moffat, where they, again, have time change. And they're using their time change measure and saying, you know, which epigenetic markers are, are um, picked out by time change. Now, the interesting thing about this is you just pick out these markers. You don't really know what they are. And they're all different for the different clocks, pretty much. There's a little bit over that, but pretty much different. And it's kind of a black box. You don't know exactly what's in it, why it's in it, and how it got there. But man, have they caught on? Why are they, why did they catch on? Because almost everything relates to your epigenetic age. So I listed the, there's so many papers. I listed the papers that I'm a co-author on. And I said to Lauren earlier, I'm a little embarrassed because this one variable stuff is sort of not the way I think you should do science. I think it's a little cheap to do one variable <laughs> every outcome, but it works for graduate students. And um, it, everything relates. All the bad things that you can think of. They, it's very hard to get a null finding here. And then almost all the health outcomes relate, which this doesn't normally happen. Most of these biomarker things, this doesn't happen. So they all relate. And now, um, Belsky has again uh, made a, a very important, I think, loud statement that, okay, this is with a drop of blood. It's actually a little more than a drop, but it's not a lot more than a drop. And it's not 22 assays, it's some drops of blood. <laughs> and um, it still costs hundreds of dollars a case, but it's, uh, it may be easier in the long run than a whole lot of things. Uh, and the other thing is, I'm going to show you, epigenetic age may be changeable. And that's important again. We are spending probably the next half dozen years, we've spent the last three or four years, I'd say, trying to understand what these clocks are all about. They're very highly related to biological age. We also make surrogates of all the things in biological age. They're all highly related. This is all sort of intertwined. In theory, these are a different level, but in practice, I don't know, and neither does anyone else, frankly, know exactly what all this means. But it's clearly an indicator of aging. <laughs> So these are the epigenetic age acceleration that occurs um, differentially here with education. And by race, ethnicity, it looks very much like the biological age, where the difference from the lowest to the highest education category is about two and a half years. And the difference between blacks and whites is about a year and a half. Very, you know, very strong. They come out that way. And then we have. Lauren, <laughs> do you recognize it? <laughs> um, Lauren related epigenetic age to early exposure. And again, she has um, exposure during the depression and the time of uh, declining incomes to people at different ages of exposure and finds the fetal exposure to be the most responsive. Uh, and, or most important in terms of subsequent, long, many years down the road, epigenetic age, which again, sort of, this is what people are sort of interested in, because the theory is that the most volatile period for epigenetic age is early in life, and that maybe as life goes on, it's less likely to change, perhaps harder to change, but we don't know yet how it changes across the lifespan, but we will in 10 years. I think we will. In the short term here, uh, oh, I didn't go ahead. Dan Belsky has still the same trial, the calorie trial. He has again divided uh, people into those who actually uh, had the caloric restriction intervention, which is the red line, and the people who 
could eat whatever they want, which is the blue line. And this is after the fact, they, ep they estimated the epigenetic age at one year after the trial started and two years after the trial started. And what you find is that the pace of epigenetic aging is slower uh, if you have calorie restriction. Now that's an intervention that anybody could, well, anybody could reduce their calories, maybe not restricted, but it's not an expensive intervention. Um, people can change their eating patterns. We don't know exactly which ones are best, but there's a whole lot of work on intermittent fasting and this and that and the other thing, ways to eat and not eat, that could potentially be important interventions. So I'm going to begin to sort of sum up here and say, um, how much of the variability in two health outcomes, major health outcomes with aging, multimorbidity and mortality, how much is explained by all the biology I can put in here, which includes biological age, epigenetic age, some RNA-seq measures, which I didn't talk about, um, but like have been shown to be important in minus, um, telomere length, mitochondrial, uh, copy number, all that biology. What you see is it's about 10% of the variability in both of those outcomes. And how much is, of, is left then of the social factors, which is all the bottom line is the, um, child, the social hallmarks of aging. And they get anywhere from like 5 to 10% too. So it's approximately equally important. We've explained if I put it uh, together, about half of some of the social differentials, we still got a lot more to go. But it's a beginning to say, OK, the social differentials work through these things. And that's what we're interested in. Now, because I was at Wisconsin, I decided to put in the, OK, where do the genes go? And there, the genes are the little tiny blue line. And that's how much is, is the genetic polygenic risk scores that actually relate to the outcomes that we're interested in. It's almost nothing compared to these things. So I don't want to badmouth genes. I believe in genes wholeheartedly. That's three generations of my family, and we don't all look like that randomly. <laughs> we look that way because we're genetically related. I believe, as one of my biology colleagues told me, if you look the, as close as you look on the outside, you probably look on the inside. And so I really do think genes are important. They're just not so great at explaining large population differences because that's not really what they're meant to do. Um, and I think, you know, the, the role they're playing in personalized medicine is absolutely unbelievable. But, and, I, and I want my genes to be um, studied when it comes to my needing certain kind of medical interventions but they're not so great for these um, populate, large population differences. So in wrapping up, where are we? Um, so delaying aging by controlling biological age and epigenetic age is both now our hope, but it's also our hype. And that, that's kind of where we are now. Um, and the, the, the hope is that we're able to actually track aging from an earlier period in life and actually make some interventions that can reduce the bad things that come down the line. And so there are drugs, as I said before, to control some of the components of biological age. I suspect many of these will become relatively common usage within the next decade. And I would say the current drugs for Alzheimer's disease that have been approved by the FDA over the last year are sort of a, a system-specific intervention in aging. And there's the long-run aim there is not to give drugs to people who have Alzheimer's disease but to people who are likely to get Alzheimer's disease and to pick those people up when either they have at most mild cognitive impairment or they have signs that they will have that kind of impairment. So the aim 
for those drugs, which is long from being actually implemented, is that we should identify people who are likely to have this problem and start providing them with drugs that will prevent the changes in their brains that appear or are probab by probability are likely to occur. We're a long ways from that, but that's kind of the way it's headed. So people are gonna be taking a lot of pills, <laughs> but um, it's better than, it may, for some people it's better than Alzheimer's. I shouldn't just say it's better than Alzheimer's because it may not be now. Um, but that's kind of the, an, uh, the way that's going and um, that's already something that real people are going to be having infused drugs <laughs> right now to actually try to uh, reduce or delay Alzheimer's, much, much as it's still in the nascent stages of actually being something that works well. Behavioral change can be implemented if people had the will. People do not seem to have the will to change the way they eat or the way they exercise. It could be, you would have to incentivize it. People keep working on what are the incentives you need and um, it seems like we can't reach that. Uh, so I think new ways will be here soon. But in the meantime, I say, keep your biology in balance. Pay a little attention to things. Don't let things get out of whack, even if you're young. You know, keep your cholesterol, keep your hypertension, keep your, your HbA1c, keep, keep a variety of things in the range they should be in. And early you can make modifications to your behaviors that may actually work. Um, keep your behavior moderate, you know, do the things they've been telling you for decades about sleeping, eating, content of diet, exercise, all those things, except, except proven treatments. And I actually think that we have not paid enough attention to mental well-being as well as physical well-being. And mental well-being is really a problem for accelerated aging, poor mental well-being. So it's something we should pay attention to. Now, the hype is what's out there that people are trying to sell you on now. This is the cover this month of The Economist. There were three or four covers this month, living to 120. How can you publish that in years when more, uh, life expectancy is actually going down um, or has been going down? This is bizarre. People are still putting this kind of stuff out. <coughs> Estimating one's epigenetic age has actually almost become a party trick in some of my circles where people go and they sort of give a blood sample as they start their cocktails and then a week or two later, they get their epigenetic age. That's nonsense. Honestly, that is nonsense. And there's lots of websites that will tell you to do that, lots of things that will tell you to do that. The variability in the first clocks from one time to another on the same sample was something like six years. That's, that's not a measure you can use for an individual then. We've now reduced it to three with some, some tricky techniques, but still, that's, that's not an individual measure yet. So there's all kinds of things out there that people want to sell you. Um, people in Silicon Valley are, you know, exchanging blood samples with younger blood, using younger blood samples. I mean, it's scary what people are doing. It's not proven and it's not proven it's going to work. So I really would not do the things that are out there that say this is going to make you stay healthy until it really is proven. So. And epigenetic age is just the hype now. So send a few hundred dollars, send us your sample, we'll send you your age. Forget it, don't, don't waste your money. Um, so, but maybe five years from now, I would have totally different advice. Just now, it's not the time. So thank you, and I'm done. We have time for a couple questions. We have a roving mic here. 
right behind. When you said uh, mental health, I, I think that's the whole name of the game. And I think, um, I think if you asked psychiatrists at the university hospital, students that um, at any age, if they're grad students or undergrad, or, <coughs> you think the people that are, might be dropping out are the severely depressed. And I think it's the mildly depressed students that drop out of college. Most of the severely depressed students that go to the hospital get treatment and they, they stay. I think anyway. Now, I can't prove this, but I, I honestly think that that's the thing. And I think when you're talking about all these health factors, I think mild depression is almost accountable for, it, for a huge number of them. And people that suffer from severe depression, I think almost none of it. You know when you say those childhood factors count for 2%? There's some, there's, there is something to saying that you survive it and you learn from stuff, and it, it toughens you in a way. And I think if people, like researchers, I'd be interested in, in listing, they always say depression. And there is like a world of difference between severe depression there and is. mild yeah. depression. And, and if you say like weight and stuff like that, if you say it's hard for us to get control over our weight, it's like saying it's hard for us to get control over our lives. Yeah, well, it's the same thing, yeah. So I, I think if you look at I don't disagree those... with you. I think we do know there's severe depression and mild depression, and we try to make those distinctions. And, you know, you may be right that severe depression gets picked up and mild is just people live with or suffer with. But, and, and many of those early adverse childhood conditions, I think, lead to depression that lasts through life that ha the consequences may, are, may really be from the depression that comes as a... Uh, as, as a part of the whole process of dealing with childhood adversity. People pick up bad behaviors and, you know, they smoke, they drink, they do all, all kinds of things because they've suffered. And depression, I mean, or other, um, other mental states are a reflection of that. I think that those of us, I mean, I'm like an old-fashioned demographer that just used to do mortality and fertility. I didn't used to think about psychological factors. But like both Carol Riff from Midas has focused on psychological factors, and now Terry Moffat in Dunedin, they both start as psychologists, so they're more attuned to that. Basically, they're both saying psychological things are very large, and we have to pay attention to them. So I agree with you. Um, the specifics of it, I think, are something to discuss, but um, I agree with you. It's they don't. No. We, we separate, I mean, at least, at least I only pretty much deal with old people. We do separate severe from uh, symptoms, severe, depression versus symptomatics depression, which is much more mild. <coughs> and, and they're both bad. I ask you a question about some of the uh, figures you put up using data. So when you put up figures that use your bio the biological age versus uh, chronological age, I was surprised you didn't differentiate by gender, um, because at least the impression I have is especially if you look at race, is those patterns really are quite different. So do you know what they would look like? What they, are those differences very similar? And it's sort of that once you take chronological age... I don't like to stand here. Yeah, so I, th I think th that's absolutely where to go. You know, one of the interesting things is people have stopped doing sex and gender. It's somehow like 20 years ago they decided we knew what was going on, and then, and then they stopped. And now I, I, I think it's basically a whole new world. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I think some things are higher or lower for men or women. And... Uh, anyway, I'm going to leave it at that because my estimates don't allow to me to really answer your question.
So we're going to stop there because we're a little bit over and go to our invite everyone to our reception just behind us. And uh, Dr. Cremens will also be around to take more questions. So let's thank Dr. Cremens again. Thank you.